Ladies and gentlemen, it is my great pleasure to introduce Dr. Pedro Nguro. Good afternoon. It's my pleasure to be here, and uh, I'm sorry I missed part of the panel. I caught the end of Wendy and the other two, uh, and I'll weigh in in that conversation in a moment. Um, and also good to see so many familiar faces. I've only been in this area now, this is the start of my third year, and I already feel like I know almost half the people here, so <laughs> uh, I guess that's a sign that I'm connected. <laughs> uh, I like to quote Lauren Hill uh, when I start with this. Uh, Lauren Hill has a song uh, about relationships, and uh, she says, it should be so simple, but you'd rather make it hard. Right? And I would say education is a lot like that, right? That is, it really should be far more simple than we've made it. Uh, education is something that we've been doing as a uh, civilization, as human beings, for as long as there have been civilizations. And uh, it happens in all kinds of countries and uh, uh, all different kinds of circumstances that we, to varying degrees and with varying respects, with, res with a degree to quality, uh, you would think that in a country as great as ours, a country with as much wealth, with, the, with such uh, advanced technology, uh, we have the ability to make people live longer than they should, perhaps. Uh, we have the ability to make fat people skinny. We can uh, uh, put uh, pigs' hearts into human beings and have them go out again. We can bomb people uh, at wherever they are. We can figure out how to get them. Uh, it would seem as though teaching kids to read should be something that we could do as a country. But all the evidence suggests that we can't. It's definitely beyond our reach because when we look around the country, what we find is not only is schooling very bad uh, in all of the major cities in this country, but even in the not so big cities, even in rural areas, we have lots and lots of evidence that we don't know what we're doing. The consistent pattern is that wherever there are large concentrations of poor kids, we don't know what we're doing. That is, it's poor kids that pose the greatest trouble for us. Because we seem, as I think that Nick Lemon pointed out already, we know how to educate middle class kids. Um, I always say that we, we're, we are best at helping the kids who need the least help. Right? Um, if, the, if the health uh, if healthcare were like that, they'd be in big trouble, right? That is, if we could only help healthy people, um, then uh, most hospitals will go out of business. And there are a lot of schools that are like that. They can only help the kids that come with parents that are uh, well-educated and kids who are highly motivated. They can do a good job with those kids. It's all those other kids that they have trouble with. And I think the, the question becomes, why is it that in a country as great as ours, we have so much trouble helping those who have the least? Well, the easy answer for that is because we give those with the least the least. Right? That is, we consistently spend the least money. We give them the least qualified teachers. We put them in the worst buildings. We uh, don't even give them textbooks sometimes. Uh, we, uh, the conditions, when, once you go inside, it becomes obvious why it's not happening. I was at a school not too long ago where kids were taking, it's an eighth grade uh, science class. All the brand new science equipment was locked in a closet. And I asked the teacher, why is the equipment locked away? He said, well, because the kids will break it if I let them use it. Hard to do science without that access to those lab, the, the mics and the, uh, the, the, the other equipment that they had there. So when you look more closely at the situation, the answer becomes obvious. I always point to Palo Alto and East Palo Alto because I spent a lot of time in the Bay Area. Here we have Palo Alto, the home to Stanford University. Uh, it serves some of the most affluent and privileged kids in the country. We spend about $13,000 per student in Palo Alto. And across the street in East Palo Alto, where we have primarily African-American Latino kids, many of whom are very poor, the city that not too long ago had the highest homicide rate in the country, we spend less than half on those kids. Everyone knows the kids in East Palo Alto need a lot more than the kids in Palo Alto. But we pretend that East Palo Alto should be able to do the same thing that Palo Alto does with less than half the resources. I don't know why we pretend that. Any of us who knows anything about education knows that it, 
the quality of the teachers matters and what you pay people matters and the facilities matter, but we consistently pretend that we can continue to give the kids who need the most the least and expect them to perform at the same levels. And so this leads me to the standards question. I am not against high standards. In fact, I'm all for high standards. I think we need to apply high standards. Question becomes, how are they used? And who's accountable? I asked a colleague of mine recently who has been one of the major proponents of MCAS in the state of Massachusetts. I asked him, when the thousands or hundreds of kids at the end of this year are unable to graduate, will there be any adults who will lose their job? Will anybody be fired because of this massive failure? And he thought about it. He said, well, maybe a principal or two might go down. But the fact of the matter is that in the name of accountability, we are holding those who are least responsible, namely the children, accountable for conditions they don't control. Because kids do not control who will teach them. They do not control whether or not the science teacher will let them use the equipment. They don't know, they can't control whether or not they'll actually get to the, all the material they'll be tested on. But we hold them accountable, even though we know full well that many of our kids go to schools where their chance to get an education that would enable them to have a chance to pass the test is slim at best. Now I have to take you inside the schools to really let you understand what's going on. I, because right here in Massachusetts, we're kind of leading the charge in this. Right? So, and in Boston, we have educational leaders who are right out front saying, this is the way we're going to go. So I was at a high school in Boston. I'm not going to name any names here. <laughs> at a high school recently, and I wanted to see what MCAS prep really looks like. So I was visiting this high school, and, and what do I find? Well, here are the kids who have failed twice now the literacy portion of the exam in an extra class set up to prepare them for their third chance on the test. And they're being taught by a sub who cannot teach them for three months. For three months, they sit in the classroom with a sub who cannot teach the material, and that's acceptable. Well, it's hardly high standards there. We pretend that we can use the ranking of schools and the ranking of children to wake schools up, to get schools to perform at higher levels, as if the problem were the just that people were kind of kicking back, not working hard, and that if we just humiliate them enough, they will get in gear. Uh, the, we saw, and we have seen, the state of California try this, in Compton, California. Compton was taken over by the state. And I should point out now that in the names of standards and accountability, Failing schools in places like California will be taken over by the state if they don't perform. Now, the state is shaking in their pants because they will have to take over hundreds of schools in California. And they've already shown in, Cal in Compton they have no magic to provide. Because the great innovation they brought to Compton when they took them over was they decided in the name of high standards they would affix letter grades to schools. Right? They, they borrowed this idea from what they'd done to restaurants in Los Angeles. Right. In, in Los Angeles, if you're worried about the cleanliness of the restaurant, look at the letter grade. It, if it gets an A grade, it's clean. If it gets an F grade, you better be very hungry. <laughs> well, they decided to apply that idea to schools. And so now you go to schools in Compton, there are big letter grades outside. And Jeb Bush thought that was such a good idea, the whole state of Florida has adopted it now. So the letter grades all around Florida. So you've got kids, I got a call today from Lisa Delpit. She's now teaching at FIU, at Florida International University, and she says uh, she's working with DNF schools, hundreds of them. So you're sending kids to school every day with a big DNF out inside the building. We're good at standards, labeling it that way. We're not so good at raising the standard, at improving where we know improvement is needed. The odd thing about this is that we, knew, we know the rankings before we come out with the results. Right, was anybody surprised last week to find which districts were at the bottom of the rankings? 
In fact, I asked a student of mine two years ago to rank the schools by the percentage of kids on free and reduced lunch.